Vice Chancellor, ladies and gentlemen. It's indeed a very great pleasure for me to welcome you here tonight. And I'd like to offer a especially warm welcome on behalf of all those present to our distinguished lecturer, Sir John Major. <clears throat> I'd also like to thank Sir John, not just for being here today, but for his encouragement of the center's work over many years, including through membership of our strategy advisory committee. We have always greatly valued your advice and guidance. More than two decades ago, uh, in fact, at a time when Sir John was in number 10, His Royal Highness, the Prince of Wales, inaugurated our distinguished lecture series with a prescient appeal for understanding and tolerance entitled Islam and the West. Today, that appeal seems as relevant, perhaps more relevant than ever. The title that Sir John has chosen is the intriguingly evocative, A World Adrift. We are particularly looking forward to your views on the key challenges facing the international community in the years ahead. And in a year in which surprise outcomes seem to have become a norm, there is a tangible sense around the globe of bearings lost or new ones taken, depending upon one's political perspective. Alongside a good number of hopes, there are also uncertainties and concerns which changes and realignments are bound to engender. The policies pursued in Europe and the United States will inevitably also have their impact both on Muslim communities in the West and on the Muslim world as a whole, facing, as it already does, such a range of issues, conflict, extremism, violence, and governance. Closer home is the pressure of refugees and migrants, and the use of Islam alongside other factors in the rise of cultural nationalisms. The mood of distrustful impatience with Muslims seems to be on the rise. The consensus on the virtues of a plurality of cultures within a tolerant political jurisdiction is under strain. Indeed, this is a time of potential upheaval for the entire international system, which will impact on relations between East and West, North and South, and on the effectiveness and unity with which the community of nations can address the many challenges and threats that the world faces today. We are fortunate to have with us this afternoon a lecturer with unrivaled national and international experience and someone whose political career was marked by important achievements both domestically and internationally. Sir John served as MP for Huntingdon from 1976 to 2001. He joined the cabinet as chief secretary to the treasury in 1987 and served subsequently as foreign secretary and chancellor of the exchequer. He became prime minister in November 1990, led his party to a fourth consecutive general election victory and served as prime minister until 1997. This was also a period of extraordinary challenge, including British participation in the international military effort required to liberate Kuwait and the conclusion of the Maastricht Treaty. He is also rightly credited for his dogged pursuit of reconciliation and an end to violence in Northern Ireland, laying the foundations for much progress that was to continue under successive governments. On a more personal note, as a fellow enthusiast, though not always 
for the same teams, I should note his deep affection for that most noble pursuit, the game of cricket. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Sir John Major. Farhan, Your Excellency, and other distinguished guests. I hope it wasn't intended to be unkind, mentioning cricket today of all days, <laughs> when uh, England have just suffered a fairly disastrous defeat uh, in India, one I hope will reverse a little later in the series, but on those wickets, I'm a little less than certain about that. There are many reasons why I'm delighted to be here with you all this evening. But I think most of all, the attraction is the Oxford Centre for Islamic Studies itself. Meets an evident need in furthering our understanding of the Islamic world and culture, and this is sadly needed in our world at the moment. And it promotes academic excellence in all its guises, and it's allied to one of the world's great universities. To someone like me, Farhan, the attraction was irresistible. I didn't go to Oxford or indeed any university. I left full-time study before my 16th birthday and only then began to work. I devoured every book I could lay my hands on and traveled most memorably to Nigeria during the Biafran War and to countries across Southeast Asia during the early years, the infancy of their independence. And as I traveled, I learned a great deal about life that with respect no university could have taught me. But the older I become, the more I believe that the most precious gift is the opportunity to stock your mind with learning at the beginning of adult life. I was asked to give a title for this lecture some months ago. And at that time, rather a turbulent one in the aftermath of the European referendum, I must be honest, Farhan, and say I hadn't even begun to think about it. November seemed a long way off. But there was a recurring theme that had troubled me for quite a long time. I am no longer in the daily political bubble, no longer in government. And being outside it, but having been inside it, I now see events through different eyes. And it seemed to me that much that was once familiar was breaking up, was being reappraised as old lessons were forgotten or ignored. A new world is forming, as yet shapeless, but vigorous and thrusting and more nationalist than it was before. Too often the response to global issues is national self-interest. We seem to be living in a world in transition, adrift with no certain destination. And that issue took root with me as a possible subject this evening, no more than a jumble of concerns of possible risks or threats that might or might not materialize. And that being so, I thought at first, there were no obvious solutions and it was therefore an unsatisfactory topic. But, but in our complex world, a great deal is inconclusive. It's simply not true that for every problem there is a solution. It is more likely that for every solution there is a new problem. So I concluded it was far better to raise concerns than push them aside and ignore them. Better to be forewarned than uninformed. And I reasoned that history is littered with events where being uninformed was fatal. If Caesar had listened to the soothsayer, he may have remained dictator of Rome. If Napoleon and Hitler had taken account of the extremes of Russian weather, they might not have suffered calamitous military defeats. We could all add to that list. So tonight, I wish to focus on risks that I believe the world can and should no longer ignore. Even before I begin, I can anticipate the cry that ignoring future risks 
is exactly what many governments do. They live in the present and they ignore the future. With respect, I don't entirely agree with that. Sometimes, perhaps, but by no means always. Government is a good deal more complex than that. It doesn't live in a vacuum. It does live in a world in which policy must obtain approval from widely differing interests. A world in which public attitudes are inflamed by events, sometimes by outrages, and impacted, often, by ill-informed and sometimes extreme or even bigoted views. But there comes a time when it is right to take stock and reset the international agenda. I believe that such a time, if not already upon us, is fast approaching. In the years immediately after the Second World War, the United Nations was formed to prevent the horrors of another such conflict if one were ever to be threatened. Subsequently, its remit widened. It widened to include human rights, peacekeeping, humanitarian, humanitarian aid, social and economic development, and much else. Its aims are noble, but 70 years on, it is hard to argue that it has fulfilled all the hopes of its founder members. Apart from the familiar and sometimes tedious criticisms of bureaucracy and inefficiency, the most potent issue seems to me to be the composition of the Security Council itself. Ten of its 15 members are elected on a temporary basis, but five, China, France, Russia, the UK and the United States, are permanent members with an effective veto on Security Council decisions. 70 years ago, these five were thought to be in a position to enforce peace, which patently, history tells us, they hadn't been able to do. And even when, as with Syria today, there is an undeniable need for action, they fail to agree, and action is withheld. And today, surely, it can no longer be argued that all of those five nations are still the dominant nations of the world. Plain truth is, the permanent five cries out for reform, and yet there is little or no chance whatsoever of that being agreed. Any proposal for change would be blocked by at least one and possibly more of the five. Any proposal for adding to the permanent membership, India, say, or Germany, or Brazil, would be opposed not only by some of the five, but also by rival countries that believed they had a prior claim to the seat. And this self-interested attitude is dispiriting and undermines the credibility of the whole institution. I do not myself believe that the need for the United Nations has gone away, quite the reverse. Its humanitarian work, for example, is vital and effective. And they now have a new Secretary General who seems, by all accounts, to be an excellent choice. And yet, and yet, if we wish the United Nations to fulfill the hopes placed upon it, then it needs reform, it needs adequate funding, and it needs to be enabled to do what it was set up to do. Without reform and resources, it can only wither in influence at a time when China and Russia are re-establishing precisely those spheres of influence that former US Secretary of State Cordell Hull told Congress would be obsolete once the United Nations was established. The point is this. The United Nations needs revisiting to accommodate the demands of today, not those of three quarters of a century ago. And that will need leadership from within the permanent five of a quality we haven't seen for a very long time. The question cries out, where is the leader who can achieve this? And at present, no one knows. 
it seems unlikely. Certainly, it will not be easy. The realignment of power never is easy. But it is necessary, and necessary soon, not in another 70 years' time. At this remarkable centre, it seems appropriate to turn for a few moments to events in the Middle East. Over the last decade and a half, we have seen the collapse of a 100 years order. The first Gulf War evicted the Iraqi army from their illegal invasion of Kuwait. The second Gulf War invaded Iraq without a plan to govern it. The Arab Spring swept away long-term autocratic leaders and gave rise to hopes that show little sign of being fulfilled in the near future. Today, there's a civil war in Syria that has led to millions being displaced and millions more becoming homeless refugees in neighboring countries such as Jordan, who have taken an extraordinary number of them. There is conflict in Iraq, in Libya, in Yemen. There's disarray in Egypt and policy disagreements even within the once united Gulf states. The long-running saga, the Israel-Palestine saga, seems to become ever more entrenched as year succeeds year, and a settlement seems to shrink into the distance rather than advance. The Sunni-Shia antagonism continues, and so does Iranian mischief around much of the region. Autocracy is gaining ground in Turkey, and the Taliban still seeks supremacy in Afghanistan. And in addition, within and part of this depressing mixture are extreme terror groups, most obviously, but not only Islamic State, all injecting their own ambitions and their own particular brand of chaos and hatred into the region. Is there a solution? I doubt that external force will ever permanently settle down the Middle East and clear its problems, although military assistance may force back terrorism. But even if the use of foreign arms changes realities on the ground, it rarely changes minds for the better. To achieve that, other principles will be required. Persuasion is better than compulsion, Religious direction can help defeat perverted versions of Islam. And arbitration, itself used by the Prophet Muhammad to broker agreements 13 centuries ago, may yet have a role to play. In recent years, many prominent, many brave religious leaders have spoken out against violence and criticized the distorted views of Islam that activate and justify the most extreme forms of terror. The former Grand Mufti of Egypt, Sheikh Ali Goma, a Sunni, has often challenged extremist views and offered non-violent interpretations of Islam. Terrorism, he stated, unequivocally, cannot be born of religion. Terrorism is the product of corrupt minds, hardened hearts, and arrogant egos all unknown to the heart of the divine. Views such as that offer hope and not hatred, and we need to hear as many of them as we can. It's always easier to set out problems than arrive at solutions. But I have no doubt about one thing. I have no doubt about that the, the fact that the solutions, when they come, must come from within the Arab world if they are to last. But the Western democracies cannot wash their hands of this. They cannot look away from the suffering that exists within the Middle East. They contributed over many years to the present unrest and the present difficulties, and they have a duty where they can to help put it right. And they have an interest in doing so. Instability at the crossroads of the world is damaging far beyond the Middle East. And a further thought, a more hopeful thought, perhaps. Apart from its natural resources, which are large but not infinite, 
The Middle East has one huge asset for the future, its human capital and the economic advantage of its youth and abilities. 70% of its population is below the age of 30, precisely the reverse of Europe, who, if I dare make the point, badly need an influx of young immigrants if it's to look to its own interests in the future. In Saudi Arabia and Iran, for example, over 50% of graduates now in the country are women, a huge, untapped, relatively untapped resource for the future. In other countries, Jordan and Tunisia spring to mind, increasing priority is being given to education. Across the region, the whole region, I think, without exception, people demand and have a right to dignity, a job, a home, a future, and a say in the future of their own country. Education, I suspect, is the key to a future that one day will meet most of those demands. We live at the moment in a world in which authority tends to be either autocratic or democratic. The autocrat can dictate action. The Democrat has a lesser freedom. The Democrat must reconcile what he does with political and public opinion, as well as his own conscience and philosophy. And he, must do, he or she must do so in a climate of opinion in which compromise is often seen as weakness rather than leadership. The committed partisan, whether from the left or from the right of politics, is contemptuous of compromise. For him or her to be a moderate, to accept that your opponents may sometimes be right, to acknowledge that wisdom is not the sole prerogative of any one philosophy, is simply seen as feeble. In every single way imaginable, this is wrong. As we look around the world today, it's clear that we need compromise and understanding perhaps as much as ever before. We need more diplomats and fewer demagogues. If nation shouts at nation and tribe abuses tribe, we merely deepen disputes in an age when news of reckless words and deeds travel swiftly to every corner of our global world. Our world is changing, more perhaps than we realize, and certainly more rapidly than is comfortable for most people. The post-war transatlantic settlements are weakening and in danger of fracturing. Western security was built upon NATO, and yet even the future of this is now being questioned in some quarters. Suddenly, NATO is no longer the rock-solid guarantee of security that we have relied upon for so long. There are cracks in the edifice. For four decades, the United States and the Soviet Union built up their nuclear arsenals and confronted one another. That mercifully, for the moment at least, has gone. Large numbers of American troops were stationed in Europe, both for its defense and as a front line against the perceived Soviet threat. And then, in 1989, the communist system collapsed. Today, a further quarter of a century on, European complacency on defense is striking. After the demise of the Soviet system, Many Europeans have come to take international peace for granted, as though it were always a given that it would be that way. They only, it seems, can imagine a peaceful future. I hope they're right, but I warn them, it is a very risky assumption. Some European nations have cut their defense spending to very low levels. Many American troops have been withdrawn. And President-elect Trump is now questioning NATO's commitment to defend countries that are only modest contributors to the organization. It may be that he is saying this only for effect,
but it shouldn't be ignored, and with President Trump in any event, we don't yet know. NATO resources are becoming a more pressing issue as the United States fiscal deficit rises and their defense spending is projected to be cut from 3.2% of GDP to 2.7% over the next decade. Even at this lower level, the US will comfortably outspend the Europeans and she is expecting her European allies to begin to close the gap. Unless Europe is prepared to massively rearm itself at a cost it cannot afford, nor is likely to be able to afford in the foreseeable future, it would be pure folly to risk the unraveling of NATO. Far better, far more logical, to accept that expenditure must rise and commit wholly and unambiguously to re-endorsing NATO as the West's defense weapon of choice. All this comes at a moment when Russia is flexing her muscles at the eastern end of Europe and acting atrociously, it would appear, in the Syrian conflict. If Europe does not contribute more to NATO for its own security, and America becomes yet more impatient with its refusal to do so, a question arises. What latitude does that leave Russia following her annexation of Crimea, her proxy war with Ukraine, her cutoffs of energy, her threats of trade embargoes, her cyber attacks on Estonia and other countries, her hostile rage at neighbors, her bullying, and her encouragement of pro-Russian minorities to ferment trouble in other countries. A united and resolute Europe can help penalize and deter Russia. A Europe in denial of risk is unable to do so. Putin's Russia seeks a veto over the policies of neighboring countries and wherever possible chips away at Western influence and American power. She undermines from within so that she can divide and rule from without. And if, as reports suggest, Russia has not just been bombing jihadist insurgents in Aleppo, but civilians as well, then she is guilty of a war crime. We need to understand that Russia has these abilities and is unafraid to use them. Power politics extends these days far beyond crude military action. I am not, and never have been, a Cold War warrior. But we ignore what Russia is doing at our peril. Of course Russia doesn't wish to go to war with the West. But we must hope Mr. Putin does not miscalculate how far he can go. China is also establishing a new sphere of influence, albeit by exerting her remarkable and growing economic power. Unlike modern Russia, China is a legitimate future rival to the United States. Her economic growth, although slowing this year to a modest 6%, how I wish we could get there, has grown at an unparalleled rate for three decades. This has helped to balance the world economy perhaps better than ever before, and is a thoroughly welcome development to my mind. But as China grows in influence, she has ambitions, poorly hidden ambitions, that unsettle a great deal of the Indo-Pacific region. President Xi is building up the military, most notably the Navy, and has asserted dubious claims in the South Sea, South China Sea, that are declared to be illegal and will one day become an embarrassment to him. Nonetheless, he is determined, determined to obtain Chinese dominance in East Asia. And to this end, he has replaced the former foreign policy caution 
with a form of muscular nationalism. We should observe, but not overreact. Some development of this kind was always likely, given China's new position in the world, and does not, I believe, does not suggest she is seeking military confrontation. But her actions are creating tensions, most obviously with Japan, although India, South Korea, and others are looking on quizzically at what is happening. More happily, China intends to develop the ancient Silk Road. And we in the West shouldn't underestimate the symbolism of this. History tells us this is where the great religions were formed, where early literature thrived, where empires rose and fell in an age when America was undiscovered and we British lived in mud huts. At home, China faces demographic challenges, an anti-corruption drive, a restless middle class fearful of losing its new wealth, and demands for democracy that Chinese leaders cannot and will not concede, as we are seeing on a small scale in Hong Kong at the present time. Although China's South China Sea adventures potentially, potentially pit her against the United States, China already has her hands full on the home front. External adventures seem very unlikely. China's neighbor, North Korea, is a greater uncertainty. Past talks have failed to end her nuclear ambitions. It's now clear that she has the capacity to launch ballistic missiles from submarines. If so, her possible targets now go beyond Tokyo and Seoul, or the region generally, and could impact anywhere within the range of the submarine. For decades, China has tolerated North Korea because were she to collapse as a state and South Korea take over, then the whole of the Korean peninsula would be an American ally. This is emphatically not what China wished to see. And until now, we have tended to see North Korea, even under the unstable Kim Jong-un, as a client state of China. But it is no longer certain that China can control her. If a North Korean submarine, armed with a ballistic capability, were to be seen crossing the Pacific, America could not, would not, dare not allow that to go unchallenged. She would have to act. We know that China-North Korea relations have worsened over recent years, not least because of North Korea's nuclear program. How much, we cannot be sure. But this opens an intriguing prospect. Will, can, America and China work together to restrain North Korea and eliminate her nuclear capacity. I hope they can. I hope they will. Over 200,000 years ago, a great convulsion, most probably an earthquake, sundered Britain from the European shelf as it created a catastrophic mega flood that formed the English Channel. Until then, Britain was a peninsula of continental Europe. Last June, another great convulsion. This time, the will of the people once again separated Britain from Europe, following a referendum debate notable for its lack of serious content its fictional expectations, and its anti-immigrant rhetoric. So much has been said and written about Brexit that I have no particular wish this evening to revisit the whole familiar argument. But there are some things I think to be said. My hope is that even if we end up wholly outside the European Union, and I hope that we don't, in our own interest, I hope that we don't, I hope that Britain and Europe can still find common cause with a relationship that binds us close together. But we can't be sure of that. 
So I wish to look for areas where the UK and her nearest neighbours can work together for mutual long-term advantage. I have spoken of NATO. We need also to cooperate on all aspects of security, on terrorism, on crime. We need a united front to contain Russian misbehaviour. We should cooperate over the migrant surge to Europe, offer more naval support in the Mediterranean, encourage investment in North Africa to promote hope and perhaps lessen the tide of migrants. We can work together to take a common position on climate change, on human rights, and on representative democracy. Irrespective of the Brexit negotiations, we need engagements with Europe, not isolation from Europe. As we concern ourselves about the UK outside Europe, Europe must consider its own future without the UK inside the European Union. What will Europe lose when the UK departs? Quite a lot. It'll lose 65 million citizens and over the last decade, its fastest growing economy. It will lose, potentially in two decades, the largest economy in Europe on recent trends. It will lose one of only two powers with a nuclear capacity and a significant military capability and it will lose the nation with the longest and deepest foreign policy reach. And these losses will weaken the European Union, especially when set against the superpowers of the United States and China. Europe, the cradle of modern civilization, is about to become less relevant. And this will become more apparent when the UK-European Union divorce is complete. Brexit has harmed the European Union in other ways too, indeed already harmed them. It has energised the anti-EU, anti-immigrant nationalists that are prevalent in, amongst other countries, France, Germany, Greece, Finland, Poland and Hungary. And these nationalist parties generally come from the far right of democratic politics. They have been enthused by Brexit. They have seen the colossus of Europe rejected. They are Davids, keen to poke a stick in the eye of Goliath. I have never hidden my own view that leaving the European Union will prove to be an historic mistake. But my view has not prevailed, and we must shift as best we can in the future. We are a significant power. We will survive. Time alone will tell whether the choice we have made is a wise or a foolish one. Either way, it cannot be denied that it is a perverse choice. In a global world, pulling together for trade and political security the UK may be about to pull away from the richest market the world has ever seen. It is, as Sir Humphrey Appleby might have said in Yes Minister, a brave decision. <laughs> 75 years ago, President Roosevelt spoke of four freedoms. Freedom of speech, freedom of worship, freedom from want, freedom from fear. Yet, Still, these are not enjoyed in much of the world. And that is not the only current discontent. Look where you may. Change in public attitude is as significant for policy as changes made by governments in public policy. Global communications have shown the dispossessed of this world what it is that they are missing. Global and social media have exposed the shortcomings of government. No one, no one should be surprised that millions and millions of people are challenging accepted wisdoms. 30 years ago, competition 
and free markets appeared to have won conclusively the argument against collectivism and became the prevailing economic philosophy in almost every part of the world. When communism collapsed, it seemed even more entrenched. Today, its unattractive underbelly has become apparent. Global free markets have lifted hundreds of millions from absolute poverty. They have increased international trade and have enriched formerly poor nations. But, but they have also widened the gap between rich and poor. They have depressed wages and jobs in industries facing competition. They have placed a premium on some skills and eliminated the need for others. And they have amplified a tendency to focus on short-term profit as opposed to long-term good. Following the subprime implosion and the financial crisis that followed it, most average wage earners in Western economies have had no real increase in their net disposable income for over a decade, while a disproportionate few have gained hugely. This is not how the free market is expected to work. It is not fair and it must not last. As a result of what has happened, amidst a rumble of anger, the anti-global, anti-trade movement has grown. Its first effect has been to undermine and try to defeat multilateral trade deals such as the not yet ratified TPP or the contentious TTIP. Trade protection itself has become a populist cry. It promises that blocking imports and reducing trade will protect domestic jobs. It's an enticing argument for the ears of the unemployed and the unpossessed. But over any period of time, it is surely wrong. Cutting trade destroys more jobs than it saves. The protectionist cry is also an anti-foreigner cry. Wicked foreigners are taking our jobs is the not very subliminal message that is put out. It is a cry that morphs neatly into the ugly anti-immigrant message from the growing volume of nationalist voices. This fuels anger, and sometimes worse, and will not go away until growth returns to replace fear with a touch of hope. One final word about these populist trends. Populism can be reformist and can lead to desirable change. But sometimes, mostly, I think, populism is the weapon of the demagogue. It may represent the will of the majority on any given day, but it ignores minority rights and opinion. It scapegoats groups that cannot defend themselves. It favors the short term over the long term. It favors those that vote over those that have no vote or can't vote. And it is an ally of the cynic, not the statesman. This evening, I have focused on a world in transition facing many potential risks. I have touched on only a few. We could have spent many hours more considering problems in Latin America or in Africa or in other parts of Asia and Europe. But there is a limit to what can be done in any given time. But despite these problems, I am still an optimist. I do believe that the risks can be headed off, that the ugly and negative voices that we hear are not the majority. They are merely those who shout the loudest. And I do believe that the liberal economic order can reburnish its credentials and that there is nothing credible to replace it. And I conclude, Farhan, with the belief that with reason and good judgment, even our most complex challenges will be able 
to be met. Thank you very much.